communion concerns, how lawmakers on Capitol Hill are responding to the USCCB initiative on the importance of the Eucharist. Money matters. The White House promotes an expanded child tax credit. Why critics are concerned with the changes. Suppressing free speech. Why a publication in Hong Kong faces an uncertain future. And World Refugee Day. What you should know about the international effort. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, June 21st, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Reaction continues to pour in from last week's U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Spring Assembly in particular on uh, moving forward to draft a document on the importance of the Eucharist in the life of the church. There was a consensus among the members of the Committee on Doctrine that one cannot discuss the centrality of the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life without addressing those actions that inflict damage to the honor due the sacrament or cause scandal to the faithful. It was never our thought. To Bishop Kevin Rhodes of the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend in Indiana reacts after the proposal passed with roughly 75 percent of the bishop's approval. The issue will be considered again at the General Assembly scheduled for November in Baltimore. Our reaction from Catholic lawmakers is mixed on Capitol Hill after the U.S. bishops voted to draft a document on the Eucharist, which would include church teaching on receiving Holy Communion. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric. Well, good evening to you, Tracy. You know, a group of 60 Democratic uh, representatives released a statement in the House of Representatives, then they call on the U.S. Catholic bishops not to uh, weaponize the Holy Eucharist. Lawmakers even used the words of Pope Francis when they said that the Holy Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. The four-page letter titled Statement and Principles, House Democrats spelled out why they are proud to be part of the living Catholic tradition and work for the dignity of every human being. It goes on to state, we believe the separation of church and state and the sacrament of the Holy Communion is central to the life of practicing Catholics and the weaponization of the Eucharist to Democratic lawmakers for their support of a woman's safe and legal access to abortion is contradictory. Some lawmakers also took to Twitter to voice their opposition. Representative Ted Liu of California, a Jesuit-educated congressman, has challenged the U.S. bishops to refuse him Holy Communion at Mass, flaunting his support for abortion and same-sex marriage. He wrote, quote, Dear U.S. CCB, I'm Catholic and I support contraception, a woman's right to choose, treatments for infertility, the right for people to get a divorce, the right of same-sex marriage. Next time I go to church, I dare you to deny me communion. Catholic Congressman Alex Mooney says he believes in what the Catechism of the Catholic Church states. Quote, from the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. I do think the church needs to stand up against folks who are, are hypocritically claiming on the one hand to be believing in the Bible and, and, and Catholic, but on the other hand, are engaged in activities that are directly contrary to, uh, you know, serious moral teachings of the Catholic Church. It is important to note that the scope for the final Eucharist doctrine uh, may be broad, and the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference cannot force an individual bishop from of forbidding a politician from receiving Holy Communion. It will be up to the individual bishops in their diocese. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN, News Nightly. Well, joining us now is Father Thomas Petrie, President of the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception at the Dominican House of Studies. Father Petrie, welcome back. Great to be with you. Uh, first off, your reaction to the USCCB initiative on the importance of the Eucharist and the vote to move forward with the draft document. 
Tracy, I was thrilled that the bishops uh, simply voted to give permission to the committee to draft this document. It's an interesting process the USCCB has. They don't even have the document. This, this was just a vote to draft a document, and there was, of course, significant discussion about it. But I think uh, we should be satisfied and, and thrilled that three-quarters of the bishops approved having the, having the document drafted, which means when the draft comes out, uh, presumably in the fall, uh, it will need two-thirds of the bishops to approve it. If already three-quarters of the bishops are approving and drafting, it seems likely that uh, the draft would be approved in the fall. Now, Father Petrie, as we just heard, dozens of Democratic lawmakers, uh, they're accusing the bishops of, quote, weaponizing the Eucharist. And we should also know they do support legal abortion. What are your thoughts on that? And what would you say to them? Well, I would say, look, everybody has to rise to live to the challenges of Jesus Christ. We all do. And w when, whenever we ga engage in behaviors or actions that are contrary to the Eucharist, the Church not only has a right, but also has an obligation to challenge and correct us. Uh, for our salvation, sure, yes, but also for the good of the Church, for the faithful. And so that's true whether or not you're a politician working on Capitol Hill or in the White House, or whether it's true if you're simply Mrs. McGillicuddy living in the, uh, sitting in the back pew of a local country parish who says something publicly on television or in the newspaper that is contradictory to Catholic teaching, to Catholic morals, and Catholic faith. It's not a weapon to be corrected. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's a sort, it's a sort of a, um, a deflection of not wanting to be corrected to say, well, you're beating me up or you're using this as a weapon against me. Well, I'm sorry. Um, if, if you're in the wrong and you're practicing and you're make, doing immoral things, you're going to be corrected. That's the gospel. That's, that's the church. That's Christianity. Yeah, another thing I want to talk about, as you heard, you know, here's some people, including political figures, are, are really challenging the bishops and demanding to be able to receive the Eucharist despite beliefs that go against church teaching. I want to talk more about that. And, you know, can a person actually demand to receive the Eucharist or any sacrament? Well, on the one hand, the Church does say that the faithful have a right to the sacraments. But on the other hand, we don't have an absolute right, especially if we are living in sin. The Church's law is very very um, clear on this, Canon 915 and Canon 916, that you should not approach if you're in mortal sin, but you should not be given the sacrament if you're excommunicated, if you're under some other penalty, or if you're persisting in obst and obstinately persisting in manifest grave sin. The Holy Father just recently, the Vatican just recently approved a whole new book of penal disciplinary processes in the Code of Canon Law. And the Holy Father himself said in the Apostolic Constitution promulgating that book that correction is part of mercy, uh, and that if we do not correct, especially real immoral behavior, we run the risk—this is what the Holy Father said—we run the risk of tolerating immoral conduct such that simple exhortations or suggestions are no longer enough. You know, another thing I want to talk about that was also discussed at the USCCB meeting was Eucharistic revival. Uh, what can you tell us about that and why it's so important? Well, I think it's wonderful that the, the bishops are, are discussing Eucharist in so many ways. Um, in, in so many in so many different venues and in, in two different documents, both this Eucharistic document and on Eucharistic revival. Um, this comes from a, the Pew poll a couple of years ago that said 69 percent of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. This is something that Bishop Robert Barron has been really involved with, and now Bishop Donald Cousins and all the bishops over the next three years are going to be engaged in various processes from local parishes through the dioceses, through uh, the national church, to... Uh, Re rekindle uh, the faithful's not only their belief in the Eucharist, but because the Eucharist is source and summit, also to help make the faithful missionaries for the Eucharist to preach and to teach uh, the truth of the real presence of Jesus Christ in the most blessed sacrament. Well, Father Petrie, thank you so much for your time today. Always great to be with you. Father Thomas Petrie, President of the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception at the Dominican House of Studies. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Well, the White House is responding to the action by the USCCB. The press secretary was asked about that this afternoon, as well as more questions regarding life issues. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. 
Tracy, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told reporters today that President Joe Biden, quote, is a strong man of faith, and as he noted just a couple of days ago, it's personal, end quote. And there was more. He goes to church, as you know, uh, nearly every weekend. He even went when we were on our overseas trip. Um, but it's personal to him. He doesn't see it through a political prism, and we're not going to comment otherwise on the inner workings of the Catholic Church. The press secretary was also asked if President Joe Biden believes a 15-week-old unborn baby is a human being. Jen Psaki would only say the president supports, quote, a woman's right to choose. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, Vice President Kamala Harris reminds her audience about the expanded child tax credit. When more families know about how they can get the relief, that is how we will be able to lift our children out of poverty. The money arrives soon. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh joined the vice president to promote the credits. If the economy doesn't work for families, it simply doesn't work at all. But while the tax credits will give moms and dads more money, it's only good for this year. President Joe Biden has said he wants to extend it for years to come. One tax expert says he's seen this movie before and it does not end well. I think that their goal, their stated goal, is to make this a permanent welfare program. Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform, says the dollars are really aimed at the ballot box. It's a way of buying votes, of, of saying to people, I will give you money if you vote for me. Um, I think that their goal, their stated goal, is to make this a permanent welfare program. The Biden administration has stated on multiple occasions that the increase in the child tax credit that was passed under the American Rescue Plan will help get impoverished American families out of poverty. But is that really the case? We tried this once with a great society and it destroyed many of the families, broke up families. Uh, checks were taxed to kids, not to dads having a job or to having a dad around. Now, the Biden administration has set up something called childtaxcredit.gov. That's childtaxcredit.gov. It's to help people get the extra cash they may have coming. And faith organizations are helping in that effort as well. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, a crackdown on journalists. What it means for the future of Hong Kong. And Iranian elections how they could alter the country's relationship with the U.S. In Hong Kong, a pro-democracy newspaper is on the verge of being shut down. Critics say it is part of a crackdown on free speech by China. Apple Daily was founded by now-in-prisoned Catholic Jimmy Lai. It supported the 2019 pro-democracy protests against Beijing, and it also opposed national security laws. Last week, police arrested Apple Daily's senior management, and the paper may not have enough money to continue publishing. Joining us now is Gordon Chang, author of both The Coming Collapse of China and The Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, welcome back. Good to see you, as always. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit more about Apple Daily, its history, and what it would mean for Hong Kong if the paper is shut down? Well, many people say Apple Daily is the main pro-democracy newspaper in Hong Kong. But actually, it's also the main newspaper in Hong Kong. And it has kept alive the spirit of democracy. As you mentioned, it was uh, founded by Jimmy Lai. He was a billionaire retailer. He didn't have to talk about freedom and democracy and everything. And so really what this is, Jimmy Lai is a hero, and uh, Beijing is absolutely determined to close Apple Daily. Apple Daily has a lot of money, but its funds have been frozen under the national security law, which Beijing imposed on June 30 of last year. And that means the paper probably could go, will go out of business um, June 26, unless it can find the funds in order to continue. Gordon, how do you see the situation with Apple Daily playing out? And also, can you give us an update on its founder, Jimmy Lai? Well, Jimmy Lai has been convicted under the national security law, and he's currently serving a term. He is also subject to further charges under the NSL. And Beijing is absolutely determined to keep him in prison for the rest of his life. Um, I hope that the people of Hong Kong will rally and support Apple Daily. For instance, on last Thursday's uh, arrest with the 500 police officers swarming the offices, um, the next day, 
Hong Kong people actually lined up at newsstands to buy Apple Daily copies to support the paper. This is reminiscent of what they did last year after an earlier raid, where people in Hong Kong bought the shares of Apple Daily in order to show their support for democracy. And those shares soared incredibly. Um, and that's really an indication that um, people in Hong Kong, they're not giving up. Well, another thing I want to talk about is a report that came out over the weekend uh, saying China is having an issue with its food supply, um, especially a grain shortage, they were saying. What more can you tell us about this, the impact on China, and also what kind of effect it can and will have on the world? About a week ago, Beijing stopped uh, all reporting on, on grain. Um, and what it was trying to do was to prevent uh, grain prices from rising because traders around the world would know that China was desperate to buy uh, grains in the market. Uh, 2020 was a very bad year for China's food security. There were floods, there were droughts, pest infestations, typhoons, all the rest of it. Um, China's not able to feed itself. And this was really brought home when Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, uh, last August started a clean your plate campaign, which was meant to prevent people from ordering too much food in restaurants, a clear sign that uh, the Chinese leadership is concerned about food security. Over the next three or four years, uh, China is projected to grow less and less of its food, and clearly Beijing sees this as a critical problem, which it should. Uh, quickly, before I let you go, I, I noticed that you recently commented on social media that, quote, in the last three decades, China's regime has never been more vulnerable. Explain to us what you mean and why you say that. There's a rumor that a vice minister of state security, Dong Jingwei, has defected to the United States. Now, Beijing says that he has not, um, but it has failed to produce Dong in public, which is a real indication that they don't have him anymore. Dong has enough information, I think, to show um, that China was, um, that, that uh, there's a military linkage in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which means that COVID-19 looks like it's a biological weapon. And indeed, it shows increasing fighting, infighting at the top of the Communist Party. Dong was an ally of Xi Jinping, which means that the Chinese ruler is probably not as safe and secure and politically strong as we have been led to believe. Well, Gordon, unfortunately, we have to leave it right there, but we're always grateful for your analysis. Thank you so much. Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. Our people in Iran are celebrating the election of a new president, a hardline cleric who won in a landslide. <laughs> The hardline cleric won in the lowest voter turnout since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Speaking today, President-elect Ibrahim Raisi said that he would not meet with President Joe Biden nor negotiate Tehran's nuclear ambitions. Uh, Ethiopians are holding a parliamentary election today amidst a war-driven humanitarian crisis. <laughs> Prime Minister Abi Ahmed inspired hopes in 2019 that authoritarian rule would end, but the Tigray War and changes of election abuse have raised questions. There are long voter lines in the capital, but a fifth of Ethiopia's polls are closed. Russian President Vladimir Putin is calling for fair and transparent parliamentary elections. The leader of Russia's public pronouncement comes as the government has been accused of stifling opposition, a charge the Kremlin strongly denies. Voters will have three days from September 17th to the 19th to elect the lower house of Russia's parliament. Four experts at the United Nations Human Rights Council have released a statement accusing the Vatican of obstruction regarding clergy sexual abuse. The 11-page letter accused the Vatican of, quote, obstructive practices regarding clergy misconduct, and it accuses the Holy See of avoiding responsibility for the issue. A church official says the statement is an attempt to undermine the credibility of the Vatican in favor of advancing pro-abortion policies.
For more on the story, including a history of the UN's Human Rights Council and its dialogue with the Vatican, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. Up next, showing support. How World Refugee Day is designed to help. And never stop seeking the Lord. The Holy Father's new message to the faithful. The head of the Archdiocese of Newark in New Jersey has been appointed to the Vatican's highest court. Cardinal Joseph Tobin is among 12 new members named today by the Holy Father. The Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura is one of three courts within the Holy See. The appointments are for five years. Uh, yesterday was the 20th annual World Refugee Day and it featured a call to protect and support migrants all over the world. According to a report by United Nations Refugee Agency, an unprecedented number of people have been forced to flee their homes and the group is calling for politicians to do more to prevent and resolve conflicts that often lead to migration. Joining us now from Rome is Colin Flynn, EWTN News Rome correspondent. Colin, great to see you. Uh, so tell us, what did Pope Francis have to say about World Refugee Day? Good evening, Tracy. Well, yesterday being World Refugee Day, Pope Francis appealed once again for help for the people of Myanmar. After the Sunday Angelus, the Pope echoed what the bishops in Myanmar have been asking for, which is that a spotlight be shone on the country and the attention brought to the plight of the people there. Now, thousands have been displaced and are starving as the country deals with a humanitarian crisis. And bishops there have been appealing for aid and that humanitarian corridors be left open and safe for refugee passage. But also that churches, monasteries, mosques and temples, as well as schools and hospitals, are respected as neutral places of refugee as well. Yesterday, the Pope asked that we, quote, open our hearts to refugees and share in their sorrows and joys and learn from their courageous resilience to become a more humane community and one big family. Can you tell us more about World Refugee Day and also what it hopes to achieve? Well, World Refugee Day is run by the United Nations and this year was its 20th anniversary and the theme was Together We Heal, Learn and Shine. And the aim of the day is to do just what Pope Francis did, raise awareness for the huge amount of refugees all over the world and encourage people to do what they can to try and help. For example, it was reported just last week that more than 40 African migrants were rescued when their boat ran aground off Spain's Canary Islands. But at least four of these migrants, sadly, including a young boy and a pregnant woman, did not survive the journey. And this is a tragic example, Tracy, of how people continue to make perilous journeys in search of a better life. In fact, ahead of World Refugee Day, the UN Higher Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, he said that while most of us stayed at home all last year to be safe from the coronavirus, more than 82.4 million men, women and children had their worlds turned upside down by war, violence and persecution. They had to run from their homes just to stay alive. Well, Colin, before I let you go, um, I understand the Catholic charity Caritas has been speaking out about the plight of refugees. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? That's right, Tracy. Caritas Europe said that they are concerned that countries in Europe are, quote, increasingly closing access to their territories. They claim this has been done through illegal pushbacks and violence towards people seeking protection and a better life in Europe. As an example, they pointed to what is happening on the border between Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, where they say that people are experiencing systematic violence, humiliation, and pushbacks. Some people, they say, have been pushed back more than 20 times trying to cross the border. Now, Caritas Europe is calling on policymakers to protect the right to asylum and the dignity of people on the move. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much, Colin. Colin Flynn, EWTN News Rome correspondent. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. And finally tonight, Pope Francis suggests that instead of fixating and obsessing over our problems, we should bring them to God. La preghiera tante volte è un grido. Signore, salvami. At a Sunday address to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy In Father Metro, says that we should never tire of seeking the Lord, adding that Christ loves us 
and he wants to help us. Pope Francis also reminds the faithful of the power of prayer, saying it can lead to miracles. Well, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.